Blog Talk Radio. Are you ready to take a bite out of the competition? Are you looking for ideas to make your business better? Welcome to the Core Business Show with Tim Jacquet. Sponsored by Apple Capital Group. At the core of every successful business, you'll find people making a difference. And with each episode of the Core Business Show, we talk with those people, examine those ideas, and explore the strategies that make them special. Now, the host of the Core Business Show, Tim Jacquet. Good morning and welcome to another episode of the Core Business Show. I'm Tim Jacquet, your host. Today, our topic is the Entrepreneur's Guide for Starting a Business. And our special guest is Connie Sparks. You you can join in in conversation by placing a question in the chat room, or you can email us at info at the Core Business Show, or you can go ahead and call the studios at 347-324-3460. Connie, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me, Tim. I guess to begin with, our audience love personal stories on CEOs and uh, your CEO of your company, uh, the Wade Institute. Kind of tell us, you know, something about yourself and how you got started. Well, Tim, Wade Institute is is actually my second company. I oh, wow. started my first business when I was seventeen, okay. and I've always had that entrepreneurial spirit. I was always busy, business savvy. When I was 17 in high school, I started doing fashion, and it actually went a play went somewhere that I really was not expecting it to. It it actually blossomed, and I actually ran that business for about six years. And unfortunately, because I was not busy business savvy enough, I had to dissolve the business because I lacked the skills of bookkeeping and Mm -hmm. managing my money. And there are other concepts of owning a business that I wasn't familiar with. So I then decided to go out and educate myself. So I went back to school, college, got my degree in business and human resources. And things kind of moved along for me uh, from that point on. I started surrounding myself with successful business owners, uh, top-level executives, um, attending networking luncheons and things like that keeping myself out there in the open, keeping my name out there, trying to build relationships. So from um, that point going forward, I decided to start the business uh, Wade Institute. Well, it was actually initially in 1995, my second consulting business. And it started out with the name of Information Public Assistance, IPAC. Mm -hmm. Three years later, my grandmother passed, and I decided what better way to honor her than to rename and restructure my company after her. And that's how Wade Institute became about. And and I will tell you, it's since then my business has flourished. It has taken me to a whole nother level. On a personal sense, I had society tell me that I could not be successful. That I could not move from the environment which I was in at the time. I had four small children. I was pretty much a single parent and I had, I was going to school and I was trying to work. So I was doing all these things on my own. And at the same time, I was in a dysfunctional relationship. So not only did I have society telling me that I wasn't going anywhere, but then I also had my then boyfriend telling me that I wouldn't be anything and wouldn't go anywhere in society as well. So that was my determining factor. That's when the light bulb went off and I said, you know what, you're not going to tell me what I cannot do. I can be successful. I can do this. So I ended that relationship shortly thereafter and I went on, took my degrees, and I started in management. And from there, Wade Institute, uh, you know, that's where it all began for me. I became full-time ownership in my business, practicing as a consultant and working with small businesses. At the time, it was primarily women who were trying to start businesses, didn't know how. At that point in time, I think the ratio of women who actually own businesses were at 5%, and this was way back in the mid-90s. So that's where my another part of my drive to really get motivated and learn as much more as much as I can about being successful in business. So Wade Institute, that's our primary focus, is helping companies, small businesses, 
start a business, but not only start a business, but stay in business. Because that's mm-hmm. the challenge. You're going to start, but just the challenge is just maintaining and staying. What an awesome story. I mean, what an awesome story from 17 years old. And you, you propel yourself in society and you kind of learn what things not to do. And then you went to college. How did college make a difference in your education and managing your second business? It gave me the knowledge to better understand and operate the key components of a business, which, again, is bookkeeping, uh, managing people, being able to strategize, create business a business plan that will help me, something that I can use going forward. And, you know, although the education of the school, you know, being going back to college, that gave me the book knowledge. But it was actually the physical, hands-on, direct experience is what has helped me evolve into the success that I'm in today because you can have the, the book knowledge and and understand all these processes, but if you don't know how to take that book knowledge and integrate it with real-life experiences, then you, you're, you're going to be faced with a lot of challenges in terms of starting that business and staying in business. So that's why I, I, I always say that, you know, it's easy to get into business. And it's easy to learn about business, but the challenge is staying in business. What particular struggles that a person will have when they talk about starting a business? The number, uh, the top maybe one or two things they really need to need to stay on top of. I would say their cash flow, because mm-hmm. if you do not, if you cannot manage your money and know how to budget your money throughout your business, because you know, as I mentioned, there. Are so many different facets of, of of owning a business. And as an entrepreneur, we have to wear all the hats, but we can't. So the the cash flow is very, very important because um, let's say if you are you have a product and you need to purchase inventory. Well, if you are managing your money correctly, then you should not have to go out and secure a loan or borrow money from a friend or a family member, you should have positioned yourself strategically to be able to purchase additional inventory without having to accrue additional debt on top of debt. And that's what I train and I, I consult my excuse me, micro businesses as well as small businesses on because they have that challenge of maintaining their cash flow, and that's very, very important. And, in, you know, in, in addition to that is being able to set aside reserves. That's one of the biggest mistakes that I can say that I've actually experienced over my 13 years of being in business, working with small businesses, even those that have been established 15, 20 years, they do not have cash reserves. So my suggestion would be is to set aside 20% of your net income monthly and set it in some type of money mutual fund, uh, excuse me, money market account, mutual fund, some type of account that will actually grow over a period of time and that you can have access to when you need it. Wow. When you're talking about if there, for example, when you sit down, there's always common questions that your, your clients ask you. And from the top of your mind, are there any FAQs that come to mind that always are going to ask you what they really need? Yes, a business no, plan. <laughs> okay. Do Let's talk about I this need... notorious business plan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I always get that question, well, do I really have to have a business plan? Well, you know, technically, yes. I highly recommend if, you, if you're not, even if you're not going for financing, because that's one of the, the mistakes that most entrepreneurs or business owners think that they need a business plan in order to to secure financing. Well, that's not always the case. You want to have a business strategy, no matter if it's two sheets, if it's 15 sheets of paper, it doesn't matter. But as long as you have something, your ideas, which are rolling around in your head and you actually put them down on paper, there's a big difference. When I teach my um, business plan writing courses, I it's very interactive, and I try to teach them that there's a whole thought process when you're writing a business plan. 
the business plan is not something that you can you should put together and then after we've created it, then stick it in the top shelf. That's mm-hmm. another mistake that a lot of entrepreneurs and those who are engaging in business, that's what they do. They'll hire consultants to come in, conduct these analysis, and help them figure out their future. And then they stuff it in the in the top drawer and they never review it. Well, that's another big mistake because what you should do with your business plan or business strategy, there are two types of business of documents. So you have your business plan, which is a more full, detailed plan that you can submit for financing. Then there's the business strategy, which is a little bit more condensed. And again, it can consist of anywhere from two to five um, pages, but it should outline your marketing strategy, who your target populations are, your cash flow, What are your strengths and your weaknesses? You know, pretty much creating a SWOT because that too, and I don't know if you're familiar with the term of SWOT, but I really try to encourage and teach small businesses on the concept of conducting SWOT analysis for their business. Before you start a business, I always recommend my clients to create and conduct a SWOT analysis because that can tell you a lot about if this is the right business for you to go in or if you should even go into business. So that should be a part of your business strategy as well. So it's just pretty much taking all of your ideas that you have in your head and putting them down on paper because you can see the big picture more so on paper than you can just rolling around in your your head. So my advice, second advice would be start with the five-year vision statement. Where do you see your company in five years? That's the starting point of creating your business strategy or your business plan. If you can say in five years, I want to own five stores, mm-hmm. I want to increase my revenue by 65%, whatever that case may be, that's where the strategy starts. Wow. So when you have that particular strategy and some people get confused or get uh, sidetracked because they are always trying to put out fires. Is it one thing they really need to take a look at? Because I know we always say, okay, you need to make sure you sell, 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 because you need that income in order for you to go on. But it's something that how to keep that business person to be really distracted, keep from getting distracted, what they really need to always focus on. Focus on that vision. Okay. And and, And I say that in the sense that if you have a mission and you are committed I guarantee you, you have a greater chance of being successful than your competitors. And yes, it is, it it can be very discouraging when your business is not doing well. You then switch into what I call survival mode. And that's the worst mode that any business person would want to be in. Speaking of which, I have a client I'm working with right now. This young lady started her first brokerage company at the age of 18. And she was doing very well, very successful. Then she decided to branch out and open up another business. So now we're at a point where she has this new business. She was not focused. She was focused on making money, but she wasn't focused enough on structuring her businesses the right way. So now she's in a fluke, and we're trying to figure out how to get her out of this this fluke. So focusing on your mission and being committed is more important. And that will be your drive. You know, SBA put out a recent report which uh, illustrated that the first two, that there are 30% of new businesses within within their first two years sell, have been selling. And this has been over the past two years. 36,000 small businesses have literally been dissolving each quarter. Now, the number of businesses that have actually opened doors or have been launched, yes, that has increased by 5%, but we still have that 36,000 which are dissolving. And all of these reasons, all of these things that we're discussing are related to them not being able to stay in business. Lack of capital, lack of resources, lack of capital, and lack of experience. So if you don't have all of those things, and or, or if these things are against you, then, yeah, I mean, there's a great chance that you will not survive in business. So I don't care how discouraged things, how bad things may appear to be, it could be worse. If you're committed, you will survive. 
Wow. We're going to take a break real quick, and we're going to go ahead and continue the survival skills of uh, how to be an entrepreneur in today's market. We'll be back in a moment. You're listening to The Core Business Show. You're listening to The Core Business Show, sponsored by Apple Capital Group. Apple Capital Group in Jacksonville, Florida, is a commercial lender that specializes in asset-based loans, equipment leasing and financing, invoice financing, commercial real estate loans, and asset-based financing in the U.S. and Canada. Apple Capital Group is a direct lender that lends on their private equity investment portfolio. 90% of most loans are decided within two hours and vendor funding within 24 hours after documents are completed with a one-page application. No slow no's, just a quick decision and a fast yes. To get more information about lending from Apple Capital Group, call 866-611-7457. That's 866-611-7457 to speak with one of our loan specialists. Or visit us right now at applecapitalgroup.com. Welcome back to The Core. Once again, here's Tim Jacquet. We're back with Connie Spark again, talking about the entrepreneur's guide for starting a business. When it came to you about writing a book with this particular title, how did you come about writing it? Is there something that say, hey, this has always been in me, and let me put this down because I can solve with people and I just want to help people? How did you come up with the title and the idea? The title came first. Coming back from my experience from my first business and after going to school and becoming a consultant, I realized that there were more of me, when I say me, back in the day when I first started who didn't have all of the resources and the experience and the knowledge needed to start a business. I realized that there were a lot of me out there. So as a result, I decided that I was going to write a book that would cover all the basis of starting a business in the mm -hmm. simple list form, not like all of these other books that are convoluted with content, um, 250 pages, and you really don't gain anything from it. I'm more of a technical person, so my books are step-by-step -step guides. So I'm taking you from point A to point Z. And that's how, over the, well, over the years, I've collected a lot of information, a lot of case studies from clients, previous people that I've worked with, and that's how I came up and finally developed the book with the title, The Entrepreneur's Guide to Starting a Business. Wow. And when you actually went through this whole process and you looked at chapters, you already came with the title, now you... You came with the chapters and writing a book. Kind of tell us about that process. How did you discern on which topics you wanted to cover? Since there's so much, so many things you can cover, how did you come up with that, That the content of the book itself? Well, again, it goes back to that step-by-step. -step. What do you need to do first? And the first thing would be to register your business. It's the okay. whole legalization of your business your DBA, filing for your name. If you decide to structure your business as a corporation, I have resources and information about how to structure your business, whether as a sole proprietor, filing your DBA, or as mm -hmm. a corporation, and what the process is for that. And then also in that first phase, applying for your EIN number. There's the misconception that as a sole proprietor, you don't need or you don't require uh, EIN number, which in part is very true. However, in this day and age, when you think about identity theft, you don't know how many hands your credit application or any of your information, how many hands it's actually going through. So to protect yourself as a sole proprietor, one would be to have this EIN number, which is your employee's identification number, also known as your tax ID number. Mm -hmm. When you file for taxes, you want to use your EIN number on the business side. On the person side, yes, you use your Social Security number, but on the business side, it's very important that you use your EIN number. Your EIN number is just another way for the government, yes, to track to track you from the business sense. And you know, in addition to that, the EIN number is important because if let's say if you're a sole proprietor and you don't have your EIN number. Some banks, some lenders, they will 
I don't want to say require, but they recommend that you apply for an EIN number or have an EIN number. And I do understand that part of your company, you deal with, with financing. But mm-hmm. with I've been in financing for about 10 years now. I assist individuals or businesses with capital as well, but I'm not going to get into that. I want to get off the subject. But these are some of the first phases of how, in terms of chapters, how I decide what information or how to structure that chapter. Second phase would be after you've applied for your DBA, your EIN number, decided what structure you want to go with, if it's sole proprietor, corporation, what have you. Then the second step would be is to start creating or working on your business strategy. That should be phase two. And with that, within that business strategy comes your research. And see, that's another big fluke of small businesses. They do not research who their target populations are. That's very important because we're all under the assumption that, well, our products, anybody can purchase our products or, you know, our services are made for everybody, which is not always the case because if you have, go ahead, Tim, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. If you have. If you have a particular product, if you have a specialized product, And it may be suitable for, let's say, women and, yes, maybe men. However, depending on the nature of that product, it may be suitable for your primary target audience, which will be women, and then your secondary, which will be men. People, small businesses, they tend to not recognize or understand who their target populations are. When you start marketing, you have to know who you're targeting. You you don't want to just put a product or a marketing campaign together as a generalized campaign. So it's very important that you know who your target population will be or are as well as your competitors. So research okay. is very key. Any places they can look to do research, can they look online? Can they go to the library? Or where can they go to make sure that – they get some real good information that's going to guide them properly. In terms of research, I don't have my book here with me. The government has, the state has put together a really good research site. And if they go to quickfacts.gov, there they can find a lot of information. It's actually that they, the site has been redeveloped or redesigned so it's more user-friendly where you can filter it. If you are doing research by consumers, their household income, two-parent household income, one-parent household income with children, whatever it may be, business to business, what, you know, how many companies or, you know, how many different types of businesses are within an industry. So quickfacts.gov would be one. Another one would be infousa.net. A second okay. site that I really like, and this is more for business-to-business operators, Manta.com. They can use this particular site for two two purposes. One would be is to research your industry to find out what the annual revenue would be for your particular size of business and type of business within that industry. Two, it can also give an idea of the size of that particular market. It, it has a research component to it as well. And then thirdly, they can use this site to generate new leads. So if, they're, if it is business to business and you are, let's say, one of your target, uh, one group that you're targeting would be, uh, let's say, retailers, fashion mm-hmm. jury, then you can simply type in fashion jury and you would not believe how many different companies that are in within that industry selling those products within your state, your city, international, it doesn't matter. Manta.com, excuse me, is one of, I would say, is a a very key resource for small businesses who are doing business-to-business operations. Wow. I'm going to segue real quick, backtrack on the employer identification number. For federal contracts and for credit reporting, you want to have the the employer identification number because you don't want to have your social security number published on court records or federal documents because it's public record. And they always encourage you, even with federal contracts, to have E 
employer identification number, ENI number, EIN number, because of that. Yeah, yeah, so uh, go ahead. So Um, that's one reason. I am so sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. That's one of the main reasons. Well, yes, and you're absolutely right. That is, and that's actually a good point because now piggybacking on that, with not only with the EIN number for contracting purposes, um, I would advise those who are interested in obtaining contracts through the government to also visit Dunn and Bradstreet or DNB.com to apply for a membership because one of the requirements to secure a deal with the government is to have that DMB number. The Dunn and Bradstreet, I love their program, their services, because they focus primarily on helping small businesses develop their business credit. In essence, you want to separate your personal credit from your business credit, and that's what Dunn and Bradstreet can help you do. And there are uh, also in your book, you talk about finding a mentor and advisory board. Can you talk about that? Advisory boards are very important. And I say that because earlier I mentioned that as entrepreneurs, we're trying to wear all the hats and we don't have all the right answers. We're not strong in all areas of our business. Well, with this advisory board, the whole purpose of them are to support you. They're not a group that you will actually pay. These are a group of individuals who have expertise in certain areas that you are weak in. So that's the key there is to find someone who has an expertise in an area that you are not good at. So if you're not good with marketing, find someone who's really good at marketing. That's their expertise, and that's what they do for a living. And ask them to be a part of your advisory board. I would not recommend more than five. And you may want to have a monthly, excuse me, a quarterly meeting with your advisory board. They can review your strategy. In essence, it's about accountability. If you have that accountability, there's a greater chance that you are going to grow and move forward in your business because Mm -hmm. that's their role is to guide you and keep you on point. Wow. Uh, also, you also mentioned something about in your book regarding office space and uh, also want to talk about networking. Regarding office space, is are there, is, I know back in 20 years ago, they had like seat offices. I mean, that you can just rent them for nothing. Right now you have virtual offices and all the other offices. What a person need to keep in mind, do they really need an office at this point, at this stage of their business? Is there a threshold they need to really look at before they they go to the expense of opening an office? Well, today I would say if you can avoid, I would not recommend going out and purchasing any type of office space. If you are, especially if you're a consultant, and it's something that you can do, you can work from home and you can create your own little comfortable space, then by all means do so. Now, I know with most consultants, who do not have an actual professional office, they will meet up in Starbucks or some type of restaurant of some sort. But yes, that's okay. But I believe your perception and your appearance says a lot about what you value and how you value your business and your customers. There are some what they call virtual offices, more or less what you were referring to. They're very inexpensive. You can, for an entire month, you can spend $150 and you can utilize their meeting room as well as their conference rooms to hold, you know, your your meeting. So there are some other alternatives, but to go out and purchase or open up your own office space, I would not recommend that. When you get to a point where, yes, you're growing and you are hiring or you need to hire a couple of extra hands and you don't have the space in your office, in your home office, then maybe then consider co-partnering with someone. Find another consultant or person who of certain of similar interests and partner. Go in and share a space so that way you're cutting your costs and you won't have as much overhead. Mm-hmm. Wow. And uh, lastly, when you talk about networking, uh, some people get networkers. Some people are afraid to death regarding mm-hmm. networking. What's your advice? Do they really need to network? Yes. I I 
think networking, especially today, is very key because it's about branding. It's about relationships. And most businesses, that's what their business is about, and that's building relationships. And in order to do that, you have to go out and network. Now, my recommendation for those who are afraid of networking, which I used to be one of those, and I had to break out of that shell. I met a young lady. I met a young lady years ago when I was in college, and she had taken me to one of her networking groups. And I kid you not, when you say nervous, my knees were literally shaking because of the level of people that I was networking with and then had to talk about myself what what my business was, that was very frightening to me. So I stumbled a lot. But then over a period of time, what she suggested to me was to write an elevator speech, a 30-second elevator speech, and then create a three-minute elevator speech. And once after I started practicing and practicing, so when I would meet people and I, you're going to always get that same question, you know, what do you do? You know, who are your customers? You should know that. So if you create an elevator speech, then it helps you, gives you a little bit more confidence. In addition to that, if you know your products or your service, then that should really help boost your confidence because you know what you're talking about versus going out networking and struggling to find the words to describe what it is that you do. If you have your elevator speech in your back pocket, you should be okay. So how do you write an elevator speech? What should be, how long it should be, and how you, what, how long it should need to be, what needs to be in it, and how do you write one? Well, okay, let's start with the 30 second. The 30 second, you know, again, evolves into the three minute, but you want to start off with who your target audiences are. So if okay. you have more than one population, you start off with this is who I'm targeting, this is the nature of my business, and this is how I help my targets or my customers. So those three simple things, who are your, who are you targeting, what your, what type of products and services you offer and how you can help your customer or prospective customers. Okay. They and should not be, excuse me, each section should not be more than one sentence. Wow. So can you give like an example of how to do one, how to do in that elevator speech? Yes. When I'm out and I'm always, and I'm asked that question, well, what is it that you do? Well, I am a consultant. I provide business analysis services to small companies who are challenged with issues and uh, management and lack of management skills who are looking to grow their business. 30 seconds. Wow. Or under. That's really quick. But very, very to the point. Because what you want to do is you want to be able to give them just enough so that they can come back and ask more questions. That's oh. the key there. That's Give the them just enough so they can come back and ask more questions. If they're really interested, they're going to come back. They're going to ask those the additional questions, and then that's going to give you an indicator that they just might be interested in your services or your products. That's really good. Lastly, I think, how can we reach out to you? Where can we find your book? And if you have any last comments you'd like to share with the community? I can be reached at... C Sparks at Wade Institute dot com. Mm-hmm. My website is Wade Institute dot com. And you know, your audience is more than free to contact me um, via email or call me at six six one six two one four zero eight zero if they have any questions. And you know, right now at this point in time I'm working on a new campaign, actually two campaigns. One okay. is offering free business analysis to small companies. Totally free. No no catch. 21 is totally free. No commitment. Um, that's a part of my promotion right now. Where I'm also developing a package, a new business pack, which will actually be ready for purchase September 14th. Okay. And what's your website again, address? Wade, Wade W-A-D-E, mm-hmm. institute.com. Okay, and they can reach out to you. You have a telephone number there at the Wade Institute? 661-621-4080. Wow. Well, thank you. Thank you for coming on and sharing us with the information on helping the entrepreneurs to start their own businesses. Really appreciate it. No problem. And thank you for having me, Tim. And on that last note, 
if I may, give just a, a brief sure. closing here for those who are starting business or are interested in engaging in a business. Please do your research and create a business strategy. Take all of your thoughts, these ideas you have in your mind, in your head, and put them down on paper. If you can create that vision statement for five years, no more than one paragraph, then you are well on your way to success. Wow. That's amazing. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it and look forward to having you again. Thank you, Tim. I look forward to it as well. Bye-bye. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Again, it's been another production of The Core Business Show. Thank you for listening. You can check out this episode on Blog Talk Radio or iTunes or go to our website. We should have some highlights regarding this interview on The Core Business Show. So, dot com. Thank you for listening. Everybody have a great day. Take care. Thank you for listening to The Core Business Show with Tim Jacquet. For more information about equipment financing and asset-based loans, visit our website, applecapitalgroup.com. That's applecapitalgroup.com. Or call us at 866-611-7457. We hope you'll join us for our next episode. And remember, you can always get to the core via iTunes. You'll find all our previous episodes there. And thanks again for listening to The Core Business Show with Tim Jacquet.